One of the common criticisms of cryptocurrency is that the transaction fees tend to be too damn high. On blockchains like Ethereum, a single transaction can cost dozens of dollars on a good day, and this has left many searching for lower cost alternatives. Today, I'm going to explain how transaction fees work, why they're needed, and which cryptocurrencies have the lowest transaction fees. Now, I hate to be crass, but before we hit the gas, I need to cover my ass. If you're here for financial advice, then I'm afraid you'll have to give this video a pass. That's because entertainment and education are the only things I blast. Please contact a financial advisor if your wallet is looking sparse. If this is the first time we cross paths, my name is Guy, and my mission is to fill your brain with crypto knowledge that will last. I do that by creating the highest quality crypto content that I can. Coins, tokens, news, reviews, and other topics the central banks can't stand. If you're already a fan, subscribing to the channel and pinging that notification bell is a good plan. If you can't watch the full show, you can skip around using the timestamps below. Just remember to smash that like button before you go. That's all you need to know. Let's see how crypto fees work and where crypto fees are low. To understand how transaction fees work in cryptocurrency, you need to be familiar with a few blockchain basics. Almost every cryptocurrency uses a blockchain to store and keep track of transactions. Now, a blockchain is basically a distributed database that's divided into chunks of data called blocks. You can think of a blockchain as being a hard drive that's shared across multiple computers around the world, which has a limit on how much data you can put into each folder, say, one gigabyte. The blockchain is stored by computers called nodes, and the transactions in each block are put there by computers called miners or validators, which are sometimes also nodes themselves. Miners and validators are incentivized to process cryptocurrency transactions in two ways. The first is through block rewards. Every time a miner or validator adds a block with transactions to the blockchain, they earn a block reward. This block reward is paid in the native cryptocurrency of that blockchain, so BTC for the Bitcoin blockchain. The second way miners and validators are incentivized to process cryptocurrency transactions is through transaction fees. As I mentioned a few moments ago, there's limited space in each block on any given blockchain. On Bitcoin, each block is around one megabyte. Logically, each transaction takes up a small amount of space in each block. On Bitcoin, the average transaction is about 350 bytes. This means around 2,800 transactions can fit in each Bitcoin block. When there are more than 2,800 transactions waiting to be added to a Bitcoin block, the people submitting transactions will attach additional fees to their transactions to incentivize the miner to choose their transaction over the others to put into the next block. This creates a sort of small-scale bidding war where the people who paid the highest transaction fees are the most likely to have their transaction put into the next block. Naturally, these transaction fees are paid in the native cryptocurrency of that blockchain, which is again BTC for Bitcoin. As many of you have seen, transaction fees on cryptocurrency blockchains will rise and fall depending on how many people are trying to submit transactions at any given time. BTC transactions actually had no transaction fees when Bitcoin first began because there weren't that many people submitting transactions, and that meant there was no competition for block space. As many of you will know, a new Bitcoin block is made roughly every 10 minutes, which is 600 seconds. When you divide Bitcoin's 2,800 transactions by 600 seconds, you get a speed of around five transactions per second. Now, you can do this same calculation with other cryptocurrencies too. And if you're wondering which cryptocurrency is the fastest and why, you can check out my video about that using the link in the description. Anyways, now that you understand the blockchain basics behind crypto transaction fees, it's time to turn it up to 11. While standard cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Dogecoin use the transaction fee structure I just explained, smart contract cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, Solana, and Avalanche are a bit different. The biggest difference is that transaction fees are not optional per se. This is because smart contracts require much more computation 
than a simple transaction. For those who don't know, a smart contract is a permanent and immutable computer program that's run by miners or validators connected to a cryptocurrency's network. This is why Ethereum is referred to as the world computer. It literally consists of a set of computers spread around the world running permanent and immutable computer programs. On Ethereum and other smart contract cryptocurrencies, this distributed computation is measured in units called gas. Instead of a limit on block size, Ethereum and other smart contract cryptocurrencies have a limit on the amount of gas that can fit into each block. Right now, the gas limit per block on Ethereum is around 30 million units. You can think of the gas limit per block as being the maximum amount of computation that the miners connected to Ethereum can process in a single block. As such, the fees you pay on smart contract cryptocurrencies are essentially paying for computation rather than block space. Obviously, different kinds of transactions require different levels of computation, and that means that different types of transactions cost differing amounts of gas. Whereas the gas limit per block refers to the maximum computation that can fit into a block, the gas limit for transactions refers to the minimum amount of computation that needs to be done by miners to process that transaction. Confusing, I know. Now, the gas limits for the different types of transactions on Ethereum can be found in the appendix of the Ethereum yellow paper. And the most important is the gas limit for a regular ETH transfer, which is 21,000 gas. With a gas limit per block of 30 million, this means you could theoretically fit around 1,400 regular ETH transfers into a single Ethereum block. Now, naturally, gas is paid for in ETH and denominated in GigaWay or GUE, which is this much ETH. In the advanced transaction settings of browser extension wallets like MetaMask, the gas limit is the amount of computation required to process the kind of transaction you want to make and the gas price is the amount of ETH you're willing to pay for that computation measured in GUE. As a rule of thumb, increasing the gas limit won't increase the likelihood that your computation will get selected by a miner, because any gas you overpay is refunded to you and not given to them. Note that this can vary depending on the complexity of your transaction and on the smart contract crypto you're using. Conversely, increasing the gas price increases the likelihood that your computation will get selected by a miner. Ever since the EIP-1559 upgrade last summer, gas prices on ETH were divided into a base fee, which is burned, and a miner tip, which of course goes to the miner. This tip, or max priority fee, is what you want to increase in MetaMask when you want your transaction to be computed quickly. Now, if you want to learn more about EIP-1559 and what effect it could have on Ethereum, you can find out using the link in the description. Anyhow, now that you hopefully understand how transaction fees work on smart contract cryptocurrencies, it's time to see which ones have the lowest transaction fees. Now, I'll start by saying that this list is not exhaustive by any means, and these transaction fees are likely to change based on the demand for space and computation as per everything I just mentioned. On that note, it's worth pointing out that Ethereum's gas fees are the lowest they've been in about six months meaning a standard ETH transaction will cost you around $5. That said, a complex transaction like a swap on a decentralized exchange will cost you around 30 bucks, and that's without the token approval you'll have to pay for if it's a token you've never used before. If you're wondering why Ethereum's gas fees are so insane, it's primarily because every token on its blockchain is a smart contract, and that makes any complex transactions involving tokens very costly for you to compute. By contrast, tokens on Cardano live natively on its blockchain, meaning there's no need for excessive computation to move them around, and that translates to cheaper transaction fees. Unfortunately, the demand for computation on Cardano has been so high lately that its transaction fees are also costing a few dollars a pop, at least in my personal experience. As for Bitcoin, its transaction fees have also been very low, with the average BTC transaction costing around a dollar. This is a far cry from the $60 that people were paying for BTC transactions when it went on a tear last April, but as you can see, Bitcoin fees tend to be quite minimal most of the time. Monero is another cryptocurrency worth mentioning, and the transaction fee for sending XMR is currently around a cent. 
This is primarily because Monero underwent an upgrade a few years ago that introduced bulletproof transactions. I explain it in a bit more detail in my most recent Monero video, which I'll leave in the description for you. Anyway, these fees aren't too far off from how much it costs to use Polygon, Ethereum's leading scaling solution. Matic transfers are also around a cent, but its complex transactions currently cost a few dollars to compute. This is because Polygon has been in high demand as an Ethereum alternative, and it's a similar story for Avalanche, where complex transactions are running hot at well over $10 a pop. For what it's worth, simply sending AVAX around costs less than a cent. The same seems to be the case for Phantom, which is another well-known Ethereum alternative. Now, if you're wondering which smart contract cryptocurrencies have the lowest fees, the answer appears to be Algorand and Solana, where simple transactions cost a fraction of a cent and complex transactions cost a few cents most of the time. In terms of standard cryptocurrencies, Stellar and XRP seem to have the lowest fees, which makes sense given that the two have a shared history and are fairly centralized. At the moment, sending around XLM or XRP will cost you less than a hundred thousandth of a cent. But the catch is that both cryptocurrencies require you to hold a minimum balance in your wallet. For Stellar, it's just one XLM, but for XRP, it's 20 XRP, which is around $15 at the time of shooting. Don't forget to read that fine print, folks. Now, before you leave an angry comment, I know that there are a few cryptos that technically charge no transaction fees. Two examples here are Cadena and IOTA. Meanwhile, a Cosmos-based cryptocurrency called Osmosis has no transaction fees for the time being, and Axie Infinity's Ronin sidechain for Ethereum gives users a small number of free transactions every day. Now, you can learn more about Axie Infinity and Ronin by using the link in the description. So now that you know zero-fee cryptocurrencies exist, you might be wondering why we need transaction fees in the first place. Well, there are three reasons. The first is security. If a cryptocurrency has no transaction fees, then it means someone could come along and, say, spam the network with more transactions than the miners or validators can process. Funnily enough, this is exactly what happened to Solana in December, and I see this as evidence that having transaction fees that are too low is almost the same as having no transaction fees at all from a security standpoint. This is why Bitcoin temporarily had a minimum transaction fee of 0.01 BTC back in the day, though this was removed shortly after BTC started to increase significantly in value. To be fair, there are ways a cryptocurrency can stay secure even without transaction fees. A perfect example is Polkadot, whose smart contract-enabled blockchains called parachains plug into Polkadot's primary blockchain called the Relay Chain for security. This is done by bonding large amounts of DOT to the Relay Chain and though this is often done with the help of the community, if the crypto project has deep pockets, it can cover the cost of its own bond. Polkadot founder Gavin Wood explained that parachains don't need to charge any transaction fees at all, though most of them choose to as it gives value to the coin or token they airdrop to parachain loan offering participants. More about Polkadot in the description. I digress. The second reason why cryptocurrencies have transaction fees is sustainability, and this is especially relevant to smart contract cryptocurrencies like Ethereum. Recall that there is a limit to how much smart contract cryptocurrencies can compute per block. Gas exists because smart contracts, particularly those made using the Ethereum virtual machine, could run into significant issues without it. For example, someone could create a smart contract that never stops demanding computing power, either by accident or on purpose. This means that a portion of the computing power available in every Ethereum block would be allocated to this faulty or even malicious smart contract in perpetuity, i.e. forever. Introducing gas not only puts a price on Ethereum's computation, but also a parameter that smart contracts can understand and respond to. When I'm out of gas, don't compute me. More importantly, gas costs exist independently of the price of ETH. A regular transaction on Ethereum will always cost 21,000 units of gas, unless the developers change this down the line. The only thing that changes is the price of gas, the same way that the price of gas is different when you go to fill up your car 
even though a full tank requires the same amount of gas, or petrol as we Brits say, in gallons or litres. This dynamic makes it possible for the gas price to stay very low, even when the price of ETH is very high, as you can see here. The third reason why cryptocurrencies have transaction fees relates to the second, and that's economic incentives. Transaction fees can be very lucrative for miners and validators, and this incentivizes more validators and miners to come and secure a cryptocurrency's blockchain. In the case of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, this incentive is large enough to create an entire industry of optimized mining equipment and novel technologies like low energy chips and immersion cooling. Transaction fees also play into sustainability because many cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Binance Coin, Avalanche, and Polygon, have a maximum supply. This means there's a point at which these cryptocurrencies will have to rely on transaction fees alone for economic incentives if they want to survive once their last coin or token is minted or mined. If you're wondering what happens to Bitcoin when the last BTC is mined, you can get my in-depth analysis using the link in the description. Now, to wrap things up, I want to give you a few tips on how you can keep transaction fees low regardless of the cryptocurrency you're using and what the future of cryptocurrency fees might look like. My first tip for keeping transaction fees low is timing. Almost every cryptocurrency blockchain has a rush hour of sorts, and transaction fees tend to be highest when everyone in the United States is awake, since that's where most cryptocurrency users are. You can see the worst and the best times to make a transaction on Ethereum using this handy graph from ethereumprice.org, which I'll leave in the description. I reckon it's safe to assume that the same rush hours apply to other cryptocurrencies as well. This ties into my second tip for keeping cryptocurrency transaction fees low, and that's alternatives. There are about a dozen cryptocurrencies that leverage the Ethereum virtual machine for smart contracts. These chains tend to have most of the major tokens you'll find on Ethereum, and the only real difference is that they're cheaper to transfer. This means that reducing your gas fees might be as easy as switching chains, and given all the native exchange integrations we're seeing for Ethereum alternatives these days, it's about as easy as it sounds. My only advice here is to stick to the most secure Ethereum chain when you can. Alternatively, you can look to Layer 2 scaling solutions for Ethereum like Arbitrum, and even Layer 2 scaling solutions for Bitcoin like the Lightning Network. Many exchanges are starting to offer native support for these too, so they'll be easier to use as time goes on. My third tip for keeping cryptocurrency transaction fees low is to try and stay away from centralized exchanges unless you're actively trading or cashing out. This is because centralized exchanges charge an arm and a leg in transaction fees and especially withdrawal fees. In my opinion, it won't be long before smart contract cryptocurrencies like Solana and Algorand offer cheaper trading fees than exchanges. And this brings me to the future of transaction fees in crypto. Now, not to hurt the feelings of any fanboys out there, but all the smart contract cryptocurrencies we've seen today will likely see high transaction fees at some point, with few exceptions, if any. The reason why was explained in depth in a video by another crypto YouTuber called Denome, which I'll leave in the description. The TLDR is an unholy combination of limitless decentralized applications and arbitrage bots. There's currently no limit on the number of dApps you can deploy on a smart contract cryptocurrency, and that means it's only a matter of time before there are users bidding up gas prices for their complex transactions to be computed so they can buy their favorite shitcoin or NFT. What's crazy is that this process doesn't even require people, because at any given time there are dozens if not hundreds of arbitrage bots that are constantly looking for discrepancies in price between cryptocurrencies on different dApps and paying high gas fees to beat the other bots to the profit margin. What's more is that even miners are pushing up gas fees by front-running any profitable transactions they see robots and humans making on the blockchain they're performing computations for. Put simply, they put their own transaction at the top and take the profits. This is called Miner Extractable Value, or MEV, and it's pretty self-explanatory. The miner extracts the value from the people transacting on a smart contract cryptocurrency before they can. MEV is a huge problem on almost every smart contract crypto, 
and over half a million dollars of value has been extracted by miners over the last year on Ethereum alone, according to Flashbots, a website that tracks this kind of stuff. If you're wondering whether your transaction has ever been front-run by a miner or arbitrage bot, you can find out using a website called sandwiched.wtf, and I'll leave it in the description for your uh, entertainment. What all of this means is that we're likely to see novel cryptocurrency fee mechanisms introduced in the not-so-distant future, such as a monthly subscription fee in lieu of paying a small price every time you move a coin or token. Until these alternatives are fleshed out, chances are we'll all be stuck paying high gas fees sooner or later, regardless of the cryptocurrency. And some would argue that this will always be the case no matter what. The only solution might be for each decentralized application to have its own sovereign blockchain. And that's exactly the kind of ecosystem Cosmos is building. You can learn more about that project using the link in the description. And that's all for today's video about transaction fees in cryptocurrency. If your brain is still intact, give that like button a smack. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell so you can find your way back. If you're looking for more Coin Bureau content, Coin Bureau Clips is where it's at. I also have a podcast that you can find on Audible, Apple Music, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. I'm, of course, active on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram, and provide crypto market insights on the daily on Telegram. The only thing better is my weekly newsletter, which is where I share some crypto wisdom, show you my portfolio, and tell you which cryptos I'll be covering next. If you want to look stylish while getting wrecked, the Coin Bureau merch store is your best bet. You can find all these resources and more using the links in the description. Thank you so much for watching until the end. I'll see you all around the next bend. This is Guy bidding you goodbye.